Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on exiting fossil fuels. My name is Shuka Bidarian. I'm an environmental activist, climate reality mentor, TV presenter, producer, and documentary maker. And today, I will be serving as the moderator for exiting fossil fuels session. If we are to truly solve the climate crisis, we need to close down all fossil fuel industries in relatively short order. We have to zero out on emissions entirely. And that means essentially wiping fossil fuel infrastructure off the planet. And how that will come to pass has to be a policy question. Subsidies for fossil fuels are one of the biggest obstacles, financial obstacles, on artificially lowering the price of fossil fuel, which is what the governments do every single year. And that is around half a trillion dollars a year. And that is basically more than triple the amount given for renewable energy. So if we take those subsidies away, the economic calculus would look and would be very different. Today, in our session on exiting fossil fuels, we will discuss how these policy changes can be made possible by looking at the three key players, governments, companies, and individuals. So without further ado, please join, join me in welcoming Professor Mark Maslin for our fireside chat. so much and welcome to Change Now. Uh, for those of you who might not know Professor Maslin, I'll try to keep it short. A very brief introduction. Mark is a professor of Earth System Science at UCL and the Natural History Museum of Denmark. He is a leading scientist with a particular interest in understanding climate change and uh, he's written some fantastic books about climate change as well, which I definitely uh, recommend them. And uh, he's been featured in so many um, well-known documentaries. So um, I tried to keep it short. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry o I can't Otherwise it makes it. me feel really, really old. So. <laughs> um, Mark, um, usually in your climate talks, I actually, one of my very uh, favorite slides is the Venn diagram that you have where you talk about collective action and you have corporations, governments, and individuals. So my first question for you, um, and most of my questions will be all around what governments can do. Yep. So what role do governments play in perpetu uh, uh, perpetuating our reliance on fossil fuels? Well, I think one of the big problems that we don't necessarily realize is how the fossil fuel industry is actually organized. So we all think of those private companies, those evil ones like BP and Shell. And actually, if we look at the largest 25 energy companies in the world, 19 of them are state or partly state owned. So instead of being a failure of capitalism, what we have is a failure of the nation state. Because we have countries that are investing in the petrochemical dollar. They're making sure they're getting that sort of money in while subsidizing these fossil fuel companies. And I think that's a huge issue because it means that we as individuals, as regulators, have real problems trying to deal with fossil fuel pollution because most of it is state sponsored. That's correct. And um, uh, can you also tell us a little bit about the biggest subsidies that come from the USA, if I'm not? Oh, uh, so if we look at uh, sort of the biggest uh, sort of uh, sus subsidies, we have USA, EU, which many of you may not actually realize, and of course China. 
And what was really interesting about the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, that was agreed uh, at COP26 last year was they put into the actual final statement phasing down coal, which was fantastic. We need to get off dirty coal as quick as possible. But they also put in phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies because there are a lot of subsidies out there that are just going into the pockets of energy companies. I'll give you an example. At the moment, uh, in many countries in Europe, because of the crisis of Ukraine, uh, energy prices are doubling. So people are having to pay twice as much for their energy to heat their homes and to heat their water. But energy companies are making three times the profit they did the same time last year. So there is a real disconnect between what we're paying and the profits of the companies. Obviously, I think um, we have seen some actions going towards the right direction by the governments, but personally, I don't think we have seen enough. So what could our governments do to help us move away from our dependence on fossil fuels? Well, I think the first thing is that governments need to realize that the green economy is huge. I mean, it's about $10 trillion per year around the world. And the problem is that we don't see it because it's actually in everything. You know, whether it happens to be your sort of like car, your electric car, whether it happens to be your paper straws, it's everywhere and it's huge. And governments don't seem to realize that, otherwise they'd be investing in that because that's where all the new jobs and all the new money is going to come from. So I think that's the first key thing. I think the second thing that governments can do is actually think about what to do with those subsidies. I mean, if you think about it, it's, as you said, half a trillion dollars per year is basically spent on fossil fuels. If we spent that on healthcare around the world, just imagine how improved that healthcare would be. So I think there's lots of things that governments can do, understand their own economy, move to renewables as quick as possible, and actually then invest in the green economy. Because what governments can do, and this is something that frustrates me, is of course they can regulate but they can also incentivize, they can subsidize, they can actually put taxation in, and the most important thing that everybody forgets, they need to enforce that to make sure the rules are being followed. And that leadership is something the companies I work with are crying out for because they really want some decent rules to follow so they can actually make a difference. And um, obviously I think um, one of the important issues that maybe we don't really talk about it as much as we should is air pollution and how, again, you look at the numbers of how many million people dying every day because of air pollution and then how that's affecting the healthcare, for instance. Can you tell us a little bit more on that? Oh, well, I have to that? say, um, Shuka, this was in your own documentary. Um, you sh pointed out that we have lost six million people due to COVID over the last two years, which is an incredible tragedy. But every year we lose 10 million people due to air pollution from fossil fuels. That's a huge, huge loss of life. And the interesting thing is if we cleaned up our air, if we got rid of fossil fuels, we will be saving those 10 million lives, but also we'll be saving a huge amount of money because healthcare costs around the world are astronomical. And uh, there's been a lot of, I would say, controversial um, discussions or you know, talks around the invasion of Ukraine and how that is going to affect um, the renewable market, fossil fuels, and all that. So um, what effect has the invasion of Ukraine had on the government's approaches to fossil fuel? Well, it's a real mixed bag. Mm. So in the EU, um, you've probably heard the announcement, the EU is putting 195 uh, billion euros into moving to renewables as quick as possible. It is tripling the amount of renewable infrastructure that's going to be built by 2030. All fantastic news. I think the frustrating thing is many of us have been warning governments. We have been telling policymakers that climate change and renewable energy is about energy security as much as it is about dealing with environmental issues. But only the invasion of Ukraine has actually put this onto the front table. But that's just Europe. 
The problem is in the USA, what we're seeing is suddenly new announcements. So all the actual oil and gas uh, sort of new sort of uh, fines that were blocked by Biden when he came in, he's now released because he really wants the USA to be completely uh, able to produce enough fossil fuels for themselves so they're not dependent on foreign powers. And the other problem is the economics. As the energy price crashes and nobody wants to buy Russian gas or oil, of course, there's other countries such as China and India who will happily buy it up cheaper because they have this huge demand. So a complete mixed bag. So some good, some bad, and just classic economics. We, as an activist, we always try to look at the um, positive side of it. So I remember when I covered the report, which was um, actually I had a few people uh, talking about it and say actually this, they disagree with the way I covered the report because they think this would the invasion of Ukraine would actually uh, make it a lot harder for renewable energy to be um, basically uh, going towards that direction that it needs to go and it basically slows down the pathway uh, but I I like to think of any horrible situation that we're in as, as a, not an opportunity but a lesson that we need to learn and try to just basically find the right solution for it and I would like to think that that might help us with the whole uh, green energy sector and how we can try to move away from our independence um, on fossil fuels and realize that, you know, um, we have the sun, we have the wind, we have the energy that, you know, doesn't keep us depending on others. Well, I, I think that it is a real wake-up call for many governments. So even though we won't have instant responses from governments, you can see around the world governments going, well, hang on. What happens if that affects our people, our fuel prices? How are we going to keep our industry going? How are we going to keep our lights on if we have a crisis in our region? So I think there will be a huge move to look at energy security. And the key thing about renewables is it's, it's your own wind, it's your own tidal, it's your own solar, OK? So again, it's something you can own and you can protect. So I think it will but it will take some time. But it, again, it's going to accelerate this huge change. But the other thing I have to remind everybody is 80% of the energy now produced in the world is from fossil fuels. We are putting up huge amounts of renewable, but that's actually just adding to the extra that we demand every year. It's not eating away at that base load of 80%. And that's something that we really need to tackle. And that's where some finance really comes in. So, yeah. and. Uh, talking about finance and obviously other organizations, tell us about the international community and what they can do to accelerate the shift away from fossil fuels. So the international community, I think, can do three things. I mean, the first thing is, please, please can the international community honor the $100 billion that we promised the least developed countries in 2010. Because that money was there, set aside by the rich nations to allow the least developed countries, the most poorest countries in the world, move away from fossil fuels as quick as possible. And trust me, 100 billion, it sounds a lot of money, but it's sort of like loose change for our rich countries. We spent $14 trillion digging ourselves out of the recession, which was caused by the pandemic. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing we need to do is I would like to see the loss and damage uh, facility. So at Glasgow, we didn't get that agreed. But this is where countries, the poorest countries, can then get compensation for the damage caused by fossil fuels being pumped into the atmosphere, causing climate change. So I think that's a real important thing. I also think that the international community needs to regulate and support the financial markets. I'll give you a mad example. Just imagine you are a least developed country. You are in charge of that country, and you have got energy demands. You know that building renewable energy is cheaper. It's cheaper to run it, it's cheaper to maintain it, and it's cheaper for your people to actually buy the electricity from that. Except when you want to build the renewables, the actual interest 
that the international banks charge you is higher than for coal-fired power stations. Why? Well, it's always been that way. You know, renewables are a bit more risky. They've only been around for 30 years. You know, this is madness. So this is the sort of thing we need to do, which is this black box in global finance, which says, oh, you know, renewables are riskier than coal. If you just said they have to be at the same percentage, every country would be putting money into renewables because they need the money to actually build it, and it's cheaper to run. And so it's stupid things like that right at the top in the heart of finance. And if you talk to bankers, they didn't even know the percentage was different. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, there you are. Now, I'm not supposed to rant at change now, am I? You know. Oh, no, I am. Passion. Yeah. Ah, passion, thank um, you. But don't worry, we always finish it with some really positive, um, hopeful messages. Excellent. <laughs> so, and that would be my last question for you. Uh, paint us a picture of what a net zero world would look like when we have divested from fossil fuels. And I really hope I'm still here to see that day <laughs> when it happens. Well, you're so young, so you'll be fine. It's the rest <laughs> of us that won't. So I think we do need to envisage that future. And it was really interesting that uh, Adam Vaughan of The New Scientist actually last year wrote an article with lots of expert input looking at what a net zero world would look like. Would it be really different? And it was interesting because a lot of people commented on Twitter about, hey, I pitched that to my editor two years previously, and they went, nah, nobody wants a good luck story. You know. But I think we do, and this is why change now is so important. We have to present that future. Just imagine, OK? Imagine we have beautiful green cities. Imagine we have cities that have almost zero air pollution, so people don't suffer from sort of asthma, chest infections, and things like that. Just imagine that. Imagine that you have houses that actually keep your house at a set temperature and it's regulated and beautifully air-conditioned when we have those heat waves, it's warmed during those winters, and all of that is stabilized. Just imagine that we have food supplies that are actually equally shared around the world, OK? Because remember, we produce enough food to feed 11 billion people. There's only 7.9 billion of us on the planet, but 825 million people still go to bed feeling hungry every night. Imagine a world where you can literally hop on a high-speed train and you can get to major cities on continents. Imagine stepping in to a beautiful, huge plane and you realize you're guilt-free because the kerosene has been produced artificially using sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide from the apps and there. Okay? Just imagine, you get on that flight and you go, this is carbon neutral, I don't have to worry about it. You can have that. You can have people that have a world which is safer, wealthier, better, and guess what? Maybe even a little happier. But we have to make sure we do that for everyone, not just the very wealthy in the richest countries such as France. Thank you, Professor Maslin. It's always a pleasure. Come on, we can do it. Yes, we're at change now. We can change it yeah, yeah. now. Right now, you're right here in Paris. Thank you so much for pleasure. your insights on this very important issue. Um, and now it's time for our amazing panel, uh, where we'll be discussing the power of law and finance in divesting from fossil fuels. Please join me in welcoming our wonderful panelists, Maria Duval and Lucy Pinson. Hello to you both, and a very warm change now. Welcome to you. Thank you so much for making time to be with us here today. Um, I have so many questions for you, so I'm going to 
uh, go ahead and start. I want to make sure that all the questions can be answered. Um, I myself am very excited to learn about law and finance and how we can actually make changes in these sectors to, to help move towards a net zero world that we are all so desperately uh, looking forward to having. Uh, Maria, I know that uh, Client Earth is an environmental law charity and my first question would be, how do you hold companies accountable for climate change, environmental degradation, and of course, pollution? Thank you for the question and thank you for having me, Shuka. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Lucy. Um, and I'm very happy also that some of my colleagues, those wonderful lawyers who do the work, are actually also in the room. So we do a number of things to hold companies accountable. What we say is that we use the full life cycle of the law in order to bring about change. And that may mean, at the very beginning, the drafting and the crafting of laws in order to hold corporates accountable in a way that they may not be able to under the law today. But actually, it's quite fascinating that the law today does enable us to do a lot of things. And that's at the national level, and it's at the European level and the international level. So we also try to seek creative ways of holding companies available with the legal tools available. And one example of how we do, and others, that in innov innovative manner is to use corporate and finance tools, which nobody would associate with the environment, in order to bring decision makers and companies accountable for environmental damage. Um, we also engage a lot with regulators because regulators are an important part of the system to bring them and their awareness to the defects that there are in, in companies' behavior today and to sort of try to push them and sometimes force them towards action because we're seeing insufficient action, I think, by regulators, it's fair to say today. And there are a variety of reasons why that is. And finally, when we have no other recourse, we go to court. And there we may be using you know, all kinds of different techniques to do that. But um, litigation is very powerful, but it's, it's, it's a long process and it yeah. can be risky. For us as an NGO, for some of our partners, it's the same thing. So we try to use all of those tools before we actually go to court. And um, I'm, I'm sure you've uh, got some very successful stories to share with us. We do. I mean, we, we, back in 2019, we were successful in Poland. As you know, Poland is an incredibly important jurisdiction in the European Union for the energy transition, um, both because of where the energy comes from today in Poland, but also because of how politically charged that transition can be for a country like that. And with some brilliant colleagues, we were able to argue that against the building of the last um, coal-fired power plant in Poland, using actually those tools that I was talking about before, essentially financial and corporate law, yeah. to demonstrate to the court that by building a new power plant, the company was not acting in the best interests of its shareholders. Because essentially what would happen to that power plant in time is that it would become a stranded asset and so a loss for the company. Thank you. Lucy, now talking about finance, can you explain to us how financial institutions can be instrumental in divesting from fossil fuels? Yes, sure. It's very simple, actually. Uh, we need to understand that uh, the world around us is being shaped by financial services. Banks, insurers, and investors provide the key financial services that are needed for companies to maintain their operation and build new projects. So if we reduce the level of capital which is accessible to these companies, for example, for developing new polluting projects, companies might be pushed to develop greener and cheaper projects. If we also put conditions as a bank to a new corporate loan to a company, it might push this company to change and transform its business model. So to take an example, for example, the insurance industry woke up actually very late uh, in the context of the climate emergency. They knew about the climate risk from the 70s, but they took 45 years to start cutting down financial services to new coal plants. Mm -hmm. But they did it. They did it, and in two years already, with only 15 insurers, right now we have more of them, but in only with only 15 insurers, we already see that small and medium-sized coal companies could not secure insurance coverage anymore. Not because there was no longer insurance coverage available, but because it became so expensive for them that they could not move ahead with their projects. So they were pushed to change their business model to greener activities. 
Now, what we need to deepen this movement and speed it up, we currently have more than 450 financial institutions that have committed to align their business model with a net zero target under 1.5 trajectories. That is good news, but now they need to deliver on this pledge. The IEA and IPCC have made, been, have made very clear that to achieve this target, we need to stop expanding fossil fuels. However, the bad news is that we have hundreds of companies that are still planning new coal, new oil, and new gas projects. One of them is a French company, Total Energies, which is the seven biggest fossil fuel expansionist worldwide, which is currently developing a big carbon bomb in uh, east of Africa named ECOP. This project needs to be stopped, and that's the second leverage that financial institutions can have. As shareholders, investors can vote against companies, against company management, and next week, actually this Friday, this coming Friday, they have an opportunity to say no to the fake climate plan being submitted to a vote by Total Energies to its shareholders. Many shareholders have already committed to vote against this plan, which still allow 50% or 70% of the capex of the company to go to fossil fuels, and more are needed, obviously, to, to avoid uh, it to pass. And that's also the second thing that financial institutions can do through engagement with uh, the companies. And would you say, because you said um, it took 25 years, uh, I'm, uh, my question is because I feel like we need to keep reminding ourselves that we don't have time and everything we do, unfortunately, because we sort of put it off for so many years and decades that now we just have to do it very quickly. So would you say the progress uh, for this transition uh, is happening rapidly at the moment or is it still going on slowly? It's definitely not going uh, quick enough. Okay. Uh, actually, we have a lot of uh, reasons to be very concerned uh, by the financial industry. Right now, the financial industry has been hiding behind the IEA for years to justify their ongoing investment into fossil fuels. The IEA itself made clear last year that there is no room for more fossil fuels. Fatih Birol, the director of the IEA, has made very clear that more fossil fuel is not a solution including right now, considering the energy context, including right now because of, of the, in, with the consequences of uh, the Russian war in Ukraine. The solutions are in renewable energies, are energy efficiencies, etc. But we see a lot of financial institutions that are uh, opposing this conclusion to keep financing not only the project, but mostly the companies that are behind these new projects. Uh, back to the law firm and uh, what we can do uh, holding the companies accountable. Obviously, uh, here is again the question of how fast things are moving forward. So uh, would you say, um, explain to us, is it national or international law playing a bigger role when it comes to um, holding companies accountable? My answer would be, it's both, actually, because it depends on the forum that you're using. So if you go before the national court, you will be using national law, but national courts also look to international instruments. And we've been seeing on sort of business and human rights and environmental rights, we've been seeing more and more courts sort of having the appetite to do that. But we also have solutions that are outside of the court. There are some companies that are, for various reasons, beyond the reach of the courts. And we may need to use other fora. Um, one is the OECD, for instance. The OECD has a mechanism whereby you can file a complaint under its guidelines um, on multinational companies. But you may also bring a complaint before the United Nations. And in those fora, for instance, contrary to national courts, they won't be looking at national laws. They will primarily be looking at international instruments. And those those can be equally powerful as national laws, and especially, I think, when it comes to building a narrative on the environment being a fundamental human right for everybody to be able to enjoy. So we really look to both planes to find the solutions that we want to bring um, to hold companies accountable. And would you say that um, it would work better if you have both uh, happening simultaneously for a case, for instance? Often you don't necessarily have them simultaneously because right. you may have different battles going on in different places against different targets. And it's just where you can bring the case against a specific actor. And that's what we're constantly doing is trying to figure out, first of all, who the 
best targets are, just because they're the most systemic actors, like Total Energy, for instance, and then figuring out where one might go after Total Energy before a court of law, and then who may be able to do that, because not everybody has the right standing before the right court of law. So there are a series of decisions that we as lawyers need to make in consultation with local partners, for instance, to find out which is the best strategy in that case that will have the biggest impact. Thank you, Maria. Lucy, now back to the finance. Um, I think Mark also mentioned it, talking about one of the biggest issues when it comes um, to borrowing money for renewable projects, large uh, projects, for instance. Um, even though renewables are often cheaper to use and to invest in, why is that and how can we change the mindset within the financial sector? So indeed, Mark told a little bit about it, and um, it's true that the IPCC has been, I mean, has been making it very clear as well with the last report that we need to invest uh, much more than we have been doing up to now into the solutions, into energy grids, into renewable energy, into uh, energy efficiency, building retrofittings, etc., and etc. And the investment needs to be multiplied by six. Um, so we can see right now that the financial industry has been failing to put the money at the right place and unfortunately is putting the money not into the solutions but uh, still into uh, the bulleting sector that we that are part of the of the issue and from which we must uh, exit um, just to name uh, to give one number the 16 uh, biggest banks worldwide have been providing uh, 4.6 trillion of dollars of financing to the fossil fuel industry since the Paris Agreement was adopted. And the 100 companies that are at the forefront of the fossil fuel expansion receive 1.86 uh, billion of financing since uh, 2016. So part of the solutions will come from the finance sector directly, but it must also come from the governments and central banks. On governments, there will be many, many measures to be implemented, but I will only name one that uh, Mark mentioned also, uh, the end of fossil fuel subsidies, mm -hmm. which is really key, and in particular, the end of uh, public financing to the development of new fossil fuel projects uh, overseas through export credit agencies. During COP26, a commitment was taken by, by um, several governments to end these subsidies by the end of this year. But unfortunately, they are not delivering it. And it's that the case of France, which is still considering supporting new gas projects overseas until 2035. That is pure insanity, considering the IEA has made very clear that we need to fully decarbonize the power sector by 2035 in developed economies and by 2040 in non-developed economies. So that's going to be very quick and obviously everyone will understand that if we keep supporting the development of new projects in 2035, we are not going to close down the sector uh, at the, in the same, uh, during the same year. So so that's really needs, it's really, really key, uh, considering that public subsidies uh, and this kind of support de-risk and make very much cheaper the projects that will not find private financing without this key public support. The second thing is central banks. Central banks right now acknowledge, ECB acknowledge uh, that they have a role to play uh, to fight climate change, but it's, it's still, um, they still need to deliver. There are several things that they can do. Obviously, they can change the prudential requirements to disincentive the financing of polluting activities and incentive the financing of the solutions. But they can also change the monetary uh, tools that they, that they use to directly support uh, the development of um, green projects in Europe for the ECB or uh, building retrofittings, will, will, which, are, which is really key if we really want to exit fossil fuels. And they can also play it both sides, so supporting the solution, but also making it much more expensive for the private sectors to keep financing uh, fossil fuel companies. Thank you. And um, now back to you because of the law. I was wondering, as Lucy is saying, they're not meeting their, you know, uh, uh, commitments and what they've, the pledges that uh, they've taken. Is there something that 
law sector can do in order to push for uh, all these issues that Lucy just mentioned in uh, for financial institutions? Yeah, so I think there is, but I wanted to first pick up on a point that Lucy made on central banks, because I think that the public financing of fossil fuel expansion is, is something that's been maybe for a long time under the radar, and that's incredibly important. And I think that during the pandemic, there was even more financing given to the wrong type of companies and the wrong type of industries. So we've taken the Central Bank of Belgium to court just for that very reason, because it's one of the central banks in Europe that's delivering a corporate bond purchase program, essentially as part of the ECB's um, Europe wide, well, to those, the, the central banks that are attached to each other, um, to, to prop up the financial markets. And essentially what's happening is that what we've noticed is that there's a fossil fuel bias in that bond purchasing program. And as long as the ECB and the national banks in Europe continue to support that, there is cheap financing for those industries on the markets. And that, of course, is exactly what we don't want to see. Big problem, yeah. Um, in terms of pledges and in terms of how we can hold financial institutions to account, I mean, I think there are a number of ways. Um, big banks around the world, private held banks, are often banks that, are, that have boards of directors and that have shareholders. And so there's an incredibly powerful um, amount of things that can be done just from that perspective. I mean, I think we've seen more and more shareholder activism, and I think we can continue to see that happening and for votes at AGMs to go against what banks are proposing in terms of their own net zero pledges and how they propose to actually um, enforce them. But also, directors of these banks, as with companies, have duties to act in the best interests of those companies. And those duties are formulated in different ways in different jurisdictions, but they're essentially always the same ones. And if these banks are funding projects that, again, will essentially be stranded assets, will provoke a tipping point from which one cannot go back, they are not acting in the best interests of the companies and of their shareholders. And from that point of view, we already have the legal tools that we need to hold these um, directors and others to account because they are making decisions that are against their own commitments and against their own legal duties under the law today in a lot of jurisdictions. So um, uh, obviously you mentioned that there are many successful stories on this. So, um, and you've worked with so many different companies obviously. Um, has it, uh, I mean, uh, could, were you successful in making sure that they change their approaches and uh, what lessons can we learn from this? How is it actually possible for the companies to change their approaches in this regard? It is. Um, so just to give you one example in another area that we haven't really touched on today, but which have, uh, relies sorry, very heavily on the fossil fuel industry, it's the plastics industry. Mm -hmm. And we recently brought a complaint in the Netherlands to the regulator against a supermarket, essentially, that is using single-use plastics and that is not reporting that use under the law. Under, so essentially, it's, it, there are provisions in a directive that is brought into national law, and that supermarket company has just not been following those rules. So we brought a complaint to the regulator, and we've already seen in the last few months since that complaint was brought, improvement on the company in terms of reporting its climate risk in relation to plastics and its plastics use. So that's one of many examples where you can see change actually happen in a matter of months, and to go back to my earlier point about litigation, without taking a company to court, which can be an expensive and risky endeavor. Wonderful. Um, for me as an activist, the uh, issue and the concept of uh, climate justice, environmental justice is extremely important. And for us as climate activists is at the core of what we do because we do believe without tackling uh, the global issue of social injustice, we won't be able to solve um, the climate crisis and actually win the fight against this crisis. And obviously you mentioned Poland, it's all about that just transition that we've been talking about it in, in Europe for quite a while now. Um, and you both mentioned that uh, in your work, so I'm interested uh, to know how uh, you look at that very important uh, concept of environmental justice, what are your approaches and how is it done in the world of law and finance? Shall I maybe kick off? Yeah, okay. So I think um, we do it in a number of manners. I mean, we very much are there and see ourselves, our mission to 
save the planet, but all of its people at the same time. And obviously we all know that the most vulnerable into, on today's planet will be those who will suffer the most from the consequences of climate change and biodiversity loss. I think the science is unequivocal on that point. And so that's something that we take very, very dearly and, and to heart with our work. Um, a couple of examples of the work that we have done is that at the moment we are representing some Torres Strait Islanders. Now the Torres Strait Islands are some islands that are north of Australia. They are part of Australia. But what they're seeing today, because they're low-lying Pacific Islands, is they're already seeing the impacts of climate change on their environment, but also on their culture. Um, so we decided a few years ago to bring a case which we brought before the United Nations Human Rights um, Council. So that's one of those alternative fora that I was mentioning. And really the case is built on the protection of human rights and the fact that the Australian government is not protecting the rights of its own citizens by um, essentially what it continues to do, which is fueling climate change as one of the you know, largest extractors of, of mining and certain fossil fuels. We've also in Poland brought a case where we are um, representing five Polish citizens mm -hmm. who are also taking their um, their government to court which I have to say is an incredible courageous move from them given some of the political context in Poland today and um, in a lot of our work we're, we're doing that I mean for instance you know one of our programs works on fisheries and of course today as the oceans warm as the as the pattern of, of fish migration changes this will have an impact on tens of millions of people who rely on fisheries in order to make a living and eke out a la livelihood and it's exactly the same thing with forests around the world where deforestation is taking livelihoods away, but it's also just changing the way of life that people have relied on for millennia. So we try to integrate human rights and justice, economic, environmental justice, into the interventions that we do. And we are looking to see how far we can take the law in terms of the recognition of some of these rights under the law today or under new legal instruments as well. Thank you, Lucy. So we'll talk more, sp speak more about the overall approach. Um, w right now, and the m dominant approach of financial institutions when they consider climate change is about protecting themselves from financial risk related to climate change. It's not about preventing their impact in the real world on the population. And that needs to change. Why? Because if in the long term, financial institutions do have an interest to limit global warming and 1.5, and in that case, in the long term, the interests of the people and the interests of financial institutions match. But in the short term, it doesn't match. It doesn't match because the reality is that, is that there is still a lot of profit to be made from financing fossil fuels. Saudi Aramco, which is the third biggest fossil fuel ex oil and gas expansionist worldwide, is the most profitable company at the moment. So the consequences are very clear. It means that the financial institutions will still profit and will still finance as long as they profit from it, from financing new coal, oil, and gas projects that unfortunately contribute to irremediable change and impacts on the population. And there is another thing that needs to be changed, but it's really related to that. It's how the financial industry, and I will take the example of the insurance industry, can respond to already change that are happening at the moment. Today, we have some insurers that are leaving areas where it becomes uninsurable to provide insurance coverage for some of the risk. People who are not responsible for the climate catastrophe are being left without any protection, without any insurance coverage, by the insurance, which find it obviously not profitable anymore to provide coverage for them because there is like climate events every year in this place. But that's really unjust considering the same insurers actually at the same time keep insuring and provide the coverage that are necessary for fossil fuel companies to expand their activities and worsening the climate situation. So that's the two things that needs to be changed. A little glimpse of hope can be found in the way the financial industry, at least some around like 30 financial institutions, that's a good point of the French ones, approach the coal sector. They, didn't, they did exclude from their portfolio companies that were building new coal plants. These companies might not be risky for them because they are very big, very diversified. Maybe coal is only a little share of their portfolio, 
but right now they are building one or two or three new coal plants that are here for decades and will have irremediable impacts. So that's the way it needs to go for coal, for all financial institutions, but also for oil, for gas, and for all other polluting sectors from which we must exist. Thank you both so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on this panel. And thank you so much for all the hard work and efforts. We need people like you. So thank you, everyone, Lucy and Maria. Youth are not only affected by climate change, they are also important players in climate change initiatives. They are agents of change, entrepreneurs, and innovators. Through education, science, or technology, young people are stepping up their efforts to accelerate climate action. So the last part of our today's session uh, is another fireside chat with an amazing award-winning activist, Chibisi Izekiel, who is joining us online right now from Ghana. Chibisi is the coordinator of Strategic Youth Network for Development. In 2020, Chibisi received the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa. He is also a climate reality leader. Greetings from Paris, Chibisi. It's, it's wonderful to see you, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, good afternoon from Accra, Ghana. I'm very excited to have another climate reality leader here with me today. Chibisi, I'm, I'm, I have many questions for you, and I'm really, really excited to hear all about your wonderful work in Africa. Um, but I'm going to start off by asking you about your involvement in the Youth Network for Development. How do you promote youth inclusion in the governance of uh, the natural resources and environmental sector. All right, um, thank you, Shoka, and uh, a very good afternoon to our wonderful audience. Um, so in terms of engaging young people in decision-making process, what I do is that I try to create the, the environment where young people can also have the opportunity to demonstrate their ability and their commitment to the fight against climate change and for promoting environmental sustainability. We do that in two ways. One is a policy level advocacy, where we develop position papers, policy briefs, statements to contribute or influence government decision-making processes. The other level is we also embark on community engagement where we directly engage young people in communities to, as it were, bridge the gap between government and people in a community. Because usually, when government comes out with policies, they're usually quite bulky, very complicated for the young person to read and appreciate or assimilate to understand. So we sim simplify this information to make it very easy for young people to read and understand. So that's the approach we adopt in bringing young people up to speed in terms of their contributing or participation in environmental governance. And that to be enhance our effort, in May 2019, the World Bank and UNDP supported us to establish a bigger platform known as the Youth in Natural Resources and Environmental Governance Platform, which basically has two objectives. One, to create a space for learning and sharing among young people on different environmental actions. And number two, to be able to embark on joint advocacy in a concerted manner. So, we are, so the platform is made up of young people who are interested in all the natural resources and environmental sector issues, such as climate change, biodiversity, energy, fisheries, forestry, mining, land, 
I mean, and the rest. So basically, that's the, how, we, we are, how we engage young people in Ghana. Um, and I know that although uh, Ghana is not one of the big emitters of uh, greenhouse gases, but it's been unfortunately massively impacted by uh, climate change and uh, it has also affected the economy. I was talking to um, the head of the Department of Environment at COP26 and, and it was quite uh, disappointing to hear what's happening to countries that have contributed so little to um, climate change and then being affected by it massively. I'm also aware that um, you are working and you've been working on an anti-coal campaign. Um, I would like to hear more about it. Does this campaign involve uh, the youth? And can you tell us a bit more about this? Yes. Um, in December 2015, the government of Ghana issued a scoping report on its intention to build a coal power plant in Ghana. And then in January 2016, government came out with a notice that if individuals, institutions, other stakeholders have any concerns, they can express their concerns regarding the construction of the coal, 700 megawatts coal fire plant, which is one of the requirements of the environmental and social impact assessment. When the news came out, um, for us as activists, we had to strategize appropriately, given the fact that Ghana hasn't been involved in coal, you know, um, in, in terms of power generation. We had to also learn from our colleagues, CSOs, especially in the African region, who are battling their government when it comes to coal power plant. So our first approach is what I want to call the submarine approach. Basically what that meant was that even though that notice came out publicly, we did not react immediately. We had to do our homework very well. We actually went into the community to engage the chiefs, the elders, the women groups, the youth groups, whether they are adequately informed on the project because it's a right to be adequately informed about the project. And then we also engage other CSOs to get a level of understanding around the code. We're doing all this on the background, you know, so that is what I meant by the submarine approach, gathering data, gathering information, so that we don't respond based on emotions or feelings, but we want to respond based on facts, based on convincing, you know, feedback to change government's intention. That was the first approach we adopted. And then one of the things we did was to go into the community as I mentioned, because I recognize or we recognize the importance of the people's power. If people agree to a cause, it's very difficult to change that cause. Therefore, we have to get the people in the community to support our cause, to rally behind us, so that we can fight this campaign you know, against our government's intention. That was the second approach we adopted. And the third approach we adopted was to provide constructive feedback or responses to government's intention. Now, government gave two main reasons why they were building a coal plant. One was that it was going to create jobs for young people. And number two, it is also going to, I mean, cost, and it's very cheap to generate energy with coal. We had to find ways to, to debunk those two proposals or those two positions. When it comes to employment, our argument was that if it's about employment, then we believe that renewable energy offers more job opportunities than coal plant. Because with a coal plant, after two or three years of constructing a plant, all the lay workers will be laid off. So that, has, that is not a sustainable job for young people. But if you look at the renewable energy across the value chain, there's a whole lot of job opportunities from wind energy, solar energy, biomass, all those have you know, job opportunities. Therefore, our position was that if government indeed wants to create jobs for young people, they would believe that renewable energy is the best option. Again, in terms of the cheapness 
of power generation when we want to use coal. We said yes. In terms of economics, it makes sense. But government also failed to also look at the other externalities. Because when it comes to coal plants, you know, um, functioning, it emits gas or emissions into the atmosphere. And for therefore, we are talking about air pollution. And that is an additional cost to the health sector in Ghana. Again, the waste from coal, the coal ash, are often deposited in water bodies. Therefore, if we allow this waste for the coal plant to be deposited in water bodies, it's going to affect the livelihoods and the lives of people living in communities who depend on water bodies for cooking, for bathing, for washing, you know, and, and, uh, and all that. So, that, so this is what the argument made. So those expenses or those costs must also be factored in the cost of power generation. So if you put all these things together, it doesn't make the coal plant a cheap source or a cheap form of power generation. So we have to provide some of these alternatives to ensure that government does not go the way of coal. So that is some of the approaches we adopted to diffuse this way uh, from, from the coal plant in Ghana. I also find it very uh, easy for people to understand just what uh, you mentioned about how it's affecting uh, people's livelihoods and uh, basically health. I always find it very easy for people to understand when you uh, basically uh, try to uh, highlight um, the, the very important fact, which is environment is very much intertwined with our health and livelihoods. And you also mentioned um, the power of people. Now I want to take you back again, uh, talking about the, the young activists and even, even children. Can you share with us the benefits or relevance of involving young people and children even in decision-making towards attaining sustainable development? I think that the benefits of involving young people and children cannot be overemphasized. Um, to begin with, one of the difficulties or the struggles of the fossil fuel industry is about the issue of stranded assets. Because we have investors who have invest, you know, put in billions of dollars into gas infrastructure, coal plants, nuclear energy. Therefore, telling them to shift to renewable energy becomes a major concern. How are they going to recoup their investment? So that becomes a general concern from these investors. But we also have an opportunity that if young people are coming up, it is important to educate them, sensitize them, that even before they take up leadership position, when it comes to investing in energy, they should look more at renewable energy as against fossil fuel. That's, that's the important role that young people bring to this, this conversation. And again, um, when we also look at the global architecture in terms of the climate change uh, mechanisms, we hear about um, 2030 agenda. There's also the 1.5 degrees by 2050. But the question is, how many of our leaders today will be alive by 2050? I'm not too sure about that. But we all know, or we can guarantee, that the young people of today, or the children of today, are also going to live to that 2050. Therefore, it is important to engage them now, so by the time they get to that stage, they don't repeat their mistakes of the older generation. So that's one important reason why it's you know, it's the benefit of engaging young people and children. And finally, young people have the right, you know, to contribute to decisions that can have direct impact on them. They must be allowed to become the co-creators of the future that we are all seeking for. So these are the, I mean, the three reasons I believe that the young people have, you know, is very beneficial to engage young people in climate action. Uh, obviously, just like uh, in COP26 here, uh, I'm unfortunately, 
you're not here to see, but there's so many young people around as well uh, trying to make a difference and basically learn. So education and raising awareness is always one thing. But I was wondering uh, if you have any message that you would like to share with our young entrepreneurs and activists here and those who are watching um, from other parts of the globe. Well, thanks, uh, Shoka. Um, what I would say in conclusion is that um, young people must see themselves as relevant actors in this process, that they must be extremely committed. In fact, they must put in more energy than the older generation because the future is all about them. And I believe that young people without any shadow of doubt have skills, have some knowledge, have some expertise that they can use as tools to contribute to the fight against climate change. I mean, today, when we talk about social media, it is largely managed by young people. So that can be a platform for knowledge sharing, for sensitization, and for reaching out in terms of best practices among young people. At, in my organization, we've managed to bring together young green entrepreneurs who are contributing to climate action or climate solution. For example, they are turning organic waste to biomass briquettes and pellets as part of as part of energy energy fuel so that's a direct contribution by young people you know as a contribution to a fight against climate change so i will encourage every young person that uh, they must be involved they must be proactive and put uh, put you know into action their skills and expertise you know in, in the fight against climate change because the future you know we can compromise on the integrity of the future so we all must come on board as young people and, and commit to the cause too busy. Thank you so very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure uh, to meet you finally and uh, just to listen to all your wonderful, uh, successful stories and insights. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome, Shoka. Thank you, everyone. And this would be the end of our session on exiting fossil fuels. And I think there is nothing left to say but um, that we have the solutions at hand. We have the will to act. And let's make 1.5 degrees a reality. Thank you.